So, Diane, um, I just have to start by saying I feel so incredibly lucky to be talking with you, as you know. Um, you're super famous to me. You're super famous to everyone in the industry. You're famous in my household. Um, I hope that for all the right reasons, you become a household name for many because of the role that you're playing, particularly at this moment in time. But as you have for so many families who may not know you by name, but know you by the better experiences that they've had. So thank you. Um, so you're a doctor, you're a professor, you're an entrepreneur, you're a culture changer. I would say you're a rabble rouser and an activist, which is one of the reasons I love you so much. Um, you're one of my favorite, favorite humans alive. Formally, however, so people can know how legit you are, you are the director of the Center to Advance Palliative Care, as many of us know it as CAPSI, which is a national organization that is really devoted to increasing access to quality palliative care in the U.S., for people living with a serious illness and their families. Under your leadership, I think this is incredibly important to point out, the number of palliative care programs in the US um, in the US hospitals has more than tripled in the last 10 years. And I can only imagine what is happening every single day as the word of these tools um, and solutions and help that you offer is getting out and people are passing it on and passing it on. Um, you are the direct co-director of the Patty and Jay Baker National Palliative Care Center. You're a professor of geriatrics and palliative medicine and Catherine Gaysman, professor of medical ethics. And you were the founder and from 1997 to 2011, director of the Hertzberg Palliative Care Institute, all the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. Um, so extraordinarily uh, impressive, all the things that you've done. Um, what I would say is at this moment in time, you're probably one of the most important people alive, truly. Um, because you've worked your whole career toward making this exact moment better. And so the reason you and I are on the phone, besides the fact that I love you and basically follow you around, <laughs> is um, last Sunday, exactly a week ago, I got a text from my mom when I woke up. And um, the text said, Alex, can you call me privately? And so I had just woken up. And I said to my honey, who was still lying in bed next to me, um, babe, would you leave me alone for a second? I need to call my mom. She wants to talk privately. And of course, I have this like doom feeling in my body. Why does my mom want to talk privately with me? My mom and I talk openly about everything we always have. Um, and so he leaves the room and I pull the covers like all the way up over my face, like snoogling into bed and call her. And she says that she wants to talk to me about whether or not she should go to the hospital if she spikes a fever. And for context, my mom and I have talked openly about end of life forever, about advanced illness. We were with my grandmother when she died. We've been with family members as, as they have passed. We have a very open conversation about it. And it, a couple things hit me all at once. Um, one, obviously as a family, we've been talking about COVID nonstop. But we had not, we're three to four to five to six weeks in, but we had not yet, my mom and I had this conversation. And how was that possible? Yeah. And one of the discussions that we've been having was around how if you go to the hospital and it's a hospital that's been hit by a surge and there is no capacity, there is this um, process that's going on where in my house, we were calling it, you go to the left, you go to the right. Um, if you are seen as someone who has hope, um, that these treatments will work for you. You go to the right, there's a ventilator for you, there's treatment for you. But if you're someone who doesn't, you're going to go to the left. And my mom was essentially saying, I don't want to go to the hospital if I'm going to go to the left because I don't want to die alone. And we went on to have this conversation about, okay, okay, mom, I hear you. I don't want you to die alone either. Let me do some research on this. If it does turn out that we're not going to send you to the hospital, we're going to be with you and care for you. I don't know how to do that. I have no idea. Should I be stockpiling morphine? Like, what would that look like? And we're having this unbelievable conversation curled up in bed on a Sunday morning that I would never have expected to have because all of our discussions before have been so much more clean on it. So I want you to, um, I wish you could literally, but figuratively climb in bed with me and my mom. And what, what should I have said? What, what is the right answer to a loved one who's over 70 calling you and saying, I don't think I want to go to the hospital. And if I don't go to the hospital, how are we prepared for this? Well, I think the first thing is everyone is understandably completely focused on all the bad outcomes 
all the people who are dying. Um, and the press is not focusing a lot on the great majority that are getting better and surviving this. And well over 80%, particularly among people who are at baseline healthy, are, are get through it and survive. Um, and most don't get sick enough to need to go to the hospital. Only a small fraction get sick enough to need to go to the hospital. So it's important to understand that while the spotlight is on the people who don't do well, the great majority do well. And there, I think that's been lost in the hype and the press coverage. And so it's really a, a matter of how are you now? Um, I don't know your mom. Um, obviously, you and she talk a lot and are very open, but she sounds like she's pretty together and pretty healthy, cognitively and physically. Is that true? It's a hundred percent true. Yeah. So her odds of even athlete. if yeah, even if she gets this, her odds of getting through it and remaining at home are quite high. Um, I know a number of people in their seventies and eighties who are. Uh, riding this out at home, and they have regular telephone contact with um, clinicians, doctors, nurses, others, but they have not gotten to a point where they couldn't catch their breath and needed to go to the hospital. Yeah. So, so that's the first thing. Yeah. So say you're in that small subgroup of people who are developing difficulty breathing. That is the point to get yourself to the hospital. Um, because even just oxygen, you know, through, through what we call nasal prongs that just sit in your nose and give you extra oxygen may be sufficient to get you through this. Um, and since we don't all have oxygen tanks sitting in our front hall closet, you know, unfortunately you have to go to the hospital to get that. Um, so, so I think my bottom line is for the great majority of people who are basically well and functional and who are not expected to die soon, that aggressive medical care is appropriate and people should pursue it because their odds of recovering and going back to how they were before this scourge occurred are pretty high. And I'm, I'm worried that all the frightening coverage is suggesting to people that it's hopeless and they should just hide at home. Well, you know, it's it's funny you share that because I was on another call yesterday with Chris Castle, who I know you've known for 30 years. Forever, yes. Same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she, I had relayed the story and this, you know, question to a bunch of these extraordinary women. And she came back and said, quote unquote, you know, Alex, age is not a death sentence. And she went on to say something really beautiful. And then she quoted you specifically. She said, temper fatalism, but also be realistic. And even so, you need to make these decisions and be equipped to make these decisions. And that the best way to do that is to start having these conversations. And then she talked about CAPSI. So, how? What are the tools that you uh, that you that you're offering? Um, and let's start with from a provider perspective for the doctors and for the nurses and for all the techs out there. What what are the the conversation starters and guidelines that you guys offer? So thanks for asking about that, Alex. What our website has lots and lots of resources on it. Among them are things like what can patients and families do to prepare for this? So for example, one of the things you can do to prepare for this is if you have pets, arrange for somebody that's going to take care of your pets if you have to go to the hospital. Arrange for someone who can pay your bills if you have to go to the hospital. Make sure you've got a bag where you remember to put your hearing aids, your dentures, your eyeglasses, things that you need and bring with you because nobody's going to be able to go home and get them for you. Make sure you bring your chargers so that you can stay in touch with people by your phone or your tablet. Um, so those are the very practical things. Just be ready for that. Um, and then the other issues, which are often very hard to talk about under under normal pre-COVID-19 circumstances are very simple. Who would you trust to make decisions on your behalf if you could no longer make your own decisions? And I always say to my patients, you know, I could walk out the door of my office here and be hit by a truck. Could happen to anybody. It has happened to friends of mine, just out of the blue. And 
unconscious, unable to communicate. If my family and doctors don't know who I would trust to speak up for me, they're just going to make whatever decisions they want. So, and that's under normal circumstances, right? Here we are in a pandemic circumstance where it's reasonable to be prepared for a situation where you might not be able to make your own decisions. So priority number one is to decide who you would trust to represent you with doctors, nurses, and other family members. And don't just decide that and write it down. Talk to that person about it. Because expecting the person you trust to know that you, you've appointed them and to know what you would want if you were unable to say is unfair. Yeah. Um, and so to be fair, make sure the person that you trust knows that you trust them to make decisions for you and that you're writing their name down as the person to turn to and their phone number. But then also tell that person what you would want if things went south. Yeah. So go ahead. Which is which is a beautiful honor. Yeah. Right. I mean, what you're really saying to someone is I love you, like be my voice. Um, and that can be a gorgeous conversation. Too. And I trust you. Trust you. I know you know who I am deep down. Yeah. And so the conversation went on yesterday. Um, you know, Chris Castle said exactly what you just said. She said, tell me about your mom. Is she healthy? I said, she's very healthy. And she said, um, well, your age is not necessarily your age. So I would say to your mom, go to the hospital. And I said, okay. I have another family member who's in their 80s who has smoked their entire life. Um, you know, how would your answer change in that situation? And Susan Edgman Levitin, who you also know of partners and MGH fame, um, came back and talked really about the importance of having these conversations that you're referencing. And she talked about the tools that they at MGH are looking to um, distribute to all their patients, to their entire population, um, starting with people who are over 70, to help encourage how to get these conversations started. Can you talk a little bit about where, where can I find those tools and what would they say I do in a situation? You know, is it different when I'm talking to somebody who's over 80 and a lifelong smoker? Yeah. So there are a number of uh, places to go for these resources. One is Rebecca Sudor's website called Prepare for Your Care. And she's developed COVID specific conversation guides on these issues that are really helpful, and they are translated into other languages. The Conversation Project, similarly, has wonderful resources about having these conversations. But I don't want it to sound really complicated, because it's not really complicated. Mm -hmm. What your decision maker, the person you trust, needs to know is what you would want if you got so sick that your odds of recovering and being able to return to an alert functional state were very, very low. The assumption is almost all of us would want full life support if there was a reasonable probability of recovery. Yeah. And so you don't need to say, I do want a vent, or I don't want a vent, or I do want dialysis, or I don't want dialysis, because of course you would want those things if they were temporary. Yeah. And you would be expected to recover. So it's not helpful to talk about specific treatments. It's helpful to say what is a state of being, a quality of life. And, and most of my patients say, if I could no longer recognize or interact with my loved ones, and that was not expected to get better, that is the point at which I want you to just keep me comfortable and focus only on that. Yeah. And, and that's not that complicated. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, no. And I think when you say it, that it, that feels so accessible and not scary. And I think right. we have to really pull it back to that and then yeah. trust in our loved ones. One of the other questions that Susan asked specifically, should I, I'd love to know if Mount Sinai and CAPSI are recommending to all patients to identify a proxy and document their wishes, or if they're recommending focusing on older adults and anyone with a complex condition. Um, I'd love to know how they're implementing these efforts with the Mount Sinai patient population. And then she said, and please send Diane my love. <laughs> Please send Susan mine. I haven't seen her in a long time. Um, so right now we are focusing on patients of clinicians, nurse practitioners, PAs, doctors in the Mount Sinai health system. And obviously the majority of people that we take care of have one or more medical conditions. That's why they see us, right? So a blast 
communication is going out to every clinician in our seven hospital system across all the boroughs saying, if you have not already done this, reach out to your patients, initiate a conversation, both about who they would trust to make medical decisions on their behalf, ask whether they have spoken with that person about that role and conveyed to them what would be most important to them, and then specifically ask them, clinician, ask patient, if they were in a state where they were not expected to recover, back to an ability to recognize and communicate with loved ones, Mm -hmm. would they want us to continue treatment despite no expectation of recovery, or would they want us to focus on their comfort. And what's really interesting is that people differ in their answer to that question. And right now, we are hoping to be able, for the most part, to be able to practice as we always did, despite the pressure on the system, because we have worked so hard to increase capacity. More beds, more ventilators, the Javits Center, the USS Comfort, the, we have a Mount Sinai in Central Park now. We are doubling and tripling our capacity so that we do not have to ration. So if you and I were having this conversation and you were the director of palliative care in a small rural community, how might your answer differ? Uh, My answer might differ in places that have fewer resources not to wait till you can't catch your breath to get help, Um, to try to get help earlier rather than later because there won't be any time to waste once you get really sick. And if your local hospital assesses you, throws you on some oxygen and can get you to a regional center, a larger regional center that has more ICU capacity, more vent capacity, more clinicians, that increases your odds of survival. So you know Sarah, my co-founder, who I've worked with for many years. Um, So she called her dad to say around this whole topic and said, I want you to know that I have decided if I had this situation happen, um, that I would not want to go to the hospital, that I would want to stay at home. And she wanted him to know that and that she wanted to be sure he was having this conversation as well. So he called her back. So they have this conversation. He calls her back the next day to say, I'm really worried about you. I'm reading this. This is a quote. You're talking about really dark stuff and you shouldn't talk about this. You're young. I'm worried that you're blue. And Sarah and I were talking about how crazy it is that even in the days of a pandemic, that this conversation is so hard for some people to have that they're even worried about the fact that someone's bringing it up with them that they want to have it. And so we've gotten permission from Sarah's dad, who's an incredibly genius guy himself. What would you say to Sarah's dad? So what I would say to Sarah's dad is there's two parts. One is it's really good that people are talking about reality and not covering their eyes and saying, oh, this isn't really happening. I'm going to pretend things are like normal. And that's a dangerous thing to do because lots of people are pretending this isn't happening and they're out and about and they're not protecting themselves or others. Um, so it's good that she's thinking about it. For I, I would say to him, it's good that she wants to communicate with you about it, I would say to him. but um, And I agree that it is a little bit surprising that an otherwise perfectly healthy young person is saying that she doesn't want life support. And I would work really hard to understand why that is. And I'd be concerned that she is saying that because she's getting... Um, caught up in the hype and the drama and the devastating outcomes that the TV likes to show us. And the reality is different. And most people do recover and most people do get better. And particularly um, a young person who is otherwise pretty healthy and has many decades to go, it is concerning that she has said she doesn't want continued life support. And I would want to understand what what thoughts led her to that conclusion? And I would um, ask a bunch of open-ended questions. And I think that's why it's so important that we're having this conversation. It always strikes me that here we are, these incredibly informed, we work in healthcare, we work in advanced illness, we work in the space and how quickly we ourselves have dramatized or whatever the right word is, right? Um, yeah. 
this fatalistic perspective. Yeah. Um, so it's incredibly helpful to talk to you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, you know, you have the gear capsi hat, which is national. Mm-hmm. You have your um, New York perspective. In both ways, you're ahead. Again, and you've also focused on this forever. What talk to us from the future? You know, what is, I'm in Boston, which is not too far behind New York, but there's a lot of parts of the country that are just beginning to gear up to go through what you are in. What will you share with them? So that's a great question. And I remember reading whenever it was three weeks ago about what was going on in Italy. And they, they just kept saying, don't do what we do. Prepare, get ready. This is really unprecedented. And we'd read that and think, oh, yeah, we should prepare. We should get ready. And it's just so hard to process this. It's just so hard to change business as usual for something that hasn't hit yet. And yet that's exactly what we have to do. Um, and it's against human nature So my main recommendation is exactly what Italy said, which is if you start preparing when you're already in search, you lose a huge opportunity to save lives and relieve suffering. And we have to overcome our denial and our human nature and keep our eyes on the prize, which is making sure we can save the maximum number of lives and that we can take care of everyone with the compassion and care that everyone deserves. And that requires preparation. So I don't know, do you want to talk about the type of preparation? Well, and, I, important? and that's also the positive of the, um, the incredible attention, the negative stories is getting Let's hope that that's going to translate into this preparedness. Yeah. I worry that some of the negative stories create paralysis and a sense of hopelessness and helplessness. And some of what you've told me about colleagues and others suggest that that sense of hopelessness and helplessness might be driving decision making. And that is not helpful. And um, it needs to be named. I think once, once people become conscious that fear, terror is driving decision-making, they can make a different decision. Um, And so I I think it's important to reflect inwards and think to oneself, am I saying this because I'm so terrified? Yeah. Or am I saying this because in fact, my odds of surviving this are poor. And for most people, the odds of surviving this are good. Yeah. And I think that that needs to be spread far and wide. You know, one of the things that you, I always laugh with you, as you know, Dan, because I feel as though you and I have been friends much longer than we have (laughs) been, as far as you know, because I've known about your work forever. Um, And since we have really become friends, it is such a treasured thing for me personally. And one of the things I didn't know about you and that I hadn't shared about myself until recently was both of us have had our own very serious health situations. And there was an interaction we had after we shared this with each other for the first time. And obviously our experiences informs our reality and informs our our thought process. And I think it's one of the reasons that you just exude this extraordinary empathy. Um, And people can listen to you when you have an authenticity and and a rawness to you that you can, that, that you learn, right? You learn from experience. Yeah. So we have talked a lot about shame over the years and this, you know, shared experience having revolved around our needing care ourselves. And this is the quote that you said um, about how you and I both felt as we became the ones who needed care, which is a very different thing than being the ones who are supplying care. You referenced the shame we felt for not being strong and healthy and in control of letting down your partner and your family. And I have said, you know, a number of times, I really think shame is just a conversation waiting to be had. Mm -hmm. So you've worked your entire career to get people to have these conversations ahead of time. So have I. Is this the moment that that really happens? And as we talk about looking for bright spots, I love the Leonard Cohen song, Anthem. And that says, um, I'll, I'll actually quote it exactly. Um, ring the bells that still can ring, forget your perfect offering. There's a crack in everything. And that's how the light gets in. You know, is this that moment? Is this the light? Will this very hard thing be something that leads all of us to have these conversations 
to bring this ferocious intention to how we can live our very best days until our last. Right. I absolutely think there are going to be a number of silver linings to this. Not least is recognition that things and money won't save us and that only love and connection will save us. And this pandemic is focusing people's minds on that. Um, People who have survived this and come out of the hospital, they're not talking about money and cars and things. They're talking about how they realize that things they've been taking for granted for years are so precious. Just being with their kids, being with their partner, seeing the sunset. Um, It was profound listening to some of these people talk. So it will reboot our sense as a society and as a globe of what matters most. Mm -hmm. And I hope it will also reboot our sense that in fact, we are all in this together. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you're wealthy, you are at risk for this. Um, Mm -hmm. And you will be in line with like everyone else for those ventilators. And so this notion that somehow we're truly separate um, is getting exploded by this. And that's a good thing. The other good thing at a more practical level is all of a sudden, all these barriers to, to providing medical care by phone or by video just disappeared. Just Medicare just said, oh, no, nope, fine, you can do it. Go ahead, you can bill, it's fine. So all these ridiculous barriers that have been there for years just vanished, evaporated. And my hope is that we will not go back. Yeah, it's funny. Um, And you and I discussed this as well. I've never loved life as much as I did when I faced my own mortality. Um, I never, I have, I was always, you know, weird and ferocious, but now I'm like so intentional every second. What am I doing with this moment? This moment matters so much. And for us as a country to be going through that together and what we're battling is not each other. We're battling this virus. And there's so many examples of what overcomes the virus is love, is compassion, is, is the notion that we are all in this together, butts in and horns out. So the, you know, I want to think for a second about the coming back to this, that this has been your life work, truly your life work from, from every angle. I have to imagine that there are a number of organizations, hospitals, that say, let's say, that have worked with you for longer and have more familiarity and more muscle memory around how do you deliver palliative care in moments that are hard. Can you share some of the very best that you've seen when this goes really, really well? What are these, a couple of examples of what that looks like? So we can model that, not just obviously in the hospital system, in the healthcare system, but us at home, what can we be modeling um, to get to these gorgeous examples of love at its best and care at its best? Well, the example you gave of uh, someone who is young and healthy saying, I don't want to go to the hospital. I don't want care if I get sick. I don't want medical care. And a father saying, are you depressed? Um, While an understandable and possibly appropriate question, it is to ask people to explore rather than label as to say, tell, you know, tell me about why, why you're feeling you wouldn't, wouldn't want medical care. Um, It's to be rather than to reject what something says because it's upsetting to go towards it and help the person you're talking to put into words feelings that may not have become conscious, such as terror. Um, because once feelings become conscious, we have a choice about whether we let the feeling drive our behavior. If the feeling is unconscious and we have a young, healthy person saying, I don't want medical care. Um, and we don't help that person explore where that statement comes from. We just start butting heads and people get more crystallized and stuck in whatever position they're in. So this is a core principle of palliative care and of good communication between doctors and nurses and patients, but also between people, which is to to say, tell me more, tell me what, tell me what's making you feel that way right now. 
and to try to suppress our own anxiety in an effort to help the person we love become conscious of what's driving behaviors or decisions. Um, so a good example is my, my kid's very long-term nanny, Bibi, who is part of our family. And she's about my age, but she has more medical problems than I do. Um, and she lives with her son in Queens, which is the true epicenter in New York City. And he came, you know, he's been going to work. He has not been isolating. And he came home with a fever and uh, did not isolate from his mother and continued going to work. So everyone in his family is furious at him. Um, why is he doing this? He knows better. And what I, what I am trying to reach him to understand what he is feeling. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure it is terror. Yeah. And that until he can name that, he can't behave, quote, rationally. And so helping people understand or name what they're feeling is really an essential well, and skill. I think and, and you're modeling that. And, you know, of course, I throw Sarah under the bus by using her as an example. But Sarah and I have had this conversation over and over again. I have the same terror. And back to this notion that shame is just a conversation waiting to be had. If we can take this moment, this incredibly unique moment in history, to have those very raw conversations with our families, that also will create muscle memory for when we come out of this that we continue to have those conversations. This right. isn't the one and done. This is a conversation you have to have over and over and over. And it actually becomes a beautiful one once you start having it, because it's an opportunity to share with each other what matters to you, you know, what, how you want to be supportive of others. And it, it's one that we think we're going to dread until we have it, then we love it. Yeah. So I want to um, close out by asking you, well, two things. First, you know, how do you think in the last six, six weeks, 12 weeks, what has changed about how you personally feel and what you bring every day to what you do? How is this imprinted on you? What it has done is make the concept of human suffering much more real. It's not one patient at a time. It's everybody. Everyone is suffering. Everyone has never been through this before. Everyone is getting a lot of confusing, contradictory information. And so this sense that our whole society, our whole globe has gotten a bad diagnosis. You know, we talk about getting a bad diagnosis and the impact that it has on the individual we're taking care of and their family. The whole globe has a bad diagnosis. And the process of coming to terms with that, understanding the reality, understanding what's most important at a population level, not just an individual level, has, has I'm thinking about that a lot. And mm -hmm. what does it mean uh, to both try to maximize our ability to save lives numerically, which we need to do with every fiber of our being, but also to recognize and be with people, be present with people in their suffering. Um, yeah. Thinking about that and how to do that. And that's why I wanted to do this with you. Yeah. Uh, because, because it's a way, it's a way to send that message more yeah. broadly. Well, which for everyone else, you can be where the light gets in. Yeah. Because if we get to hear that, right? What a gift. So three things that we should all be doing right now. Okay. So number one, decide who you would trust to make medical decisions on your behalf if you are unable to make that decision and speak to that person and make sure they're willing to serve. Number two, think about what you personally would want if you got so sick that doctors thought it was very unlikely, whether less than 5%, less than 1%, you choose the number, that you would be likely to recover, to be able to recognize and interact with your loved ones. Under that circumstance, would you want everyone to keep 
trying to keep your body alive, um, which we will do if that's what you say you want, or would you want care focused on your comfort under that circumstance? Mm -hmm. Many people would tolerate a high degree of loss of function and independence if they could still recognize and interact with the people they love. Yeah. Um, and so that's the example that I use. Um, and the third thing is to think about what you would need to be prepared for should you get sick and need to go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And those are the things I mentioned before. Is there somebody who could take care of your pets? Is there somebody who could water your plants, particularly for those of us who live alone? Mm -hmm. um, what do you need to make sure you have ready to go? Your chargers, your glasses, your dentures, your hearing aids, your devices. Um, because if you get sick, sometimes people get sick really fast. And so get ready. Your, your answers are so beautiful in that they range from the you know, the, you know, ripping out your soul and offering it to your loved ones saying, let's pour over this together all the way back to, and practically and tactically, right? It's sort of the, the, the things that you hear from people, what matters the most to their senior is that they, someone says, here are your hearing aids, because if you can't hear, you feel so, right? So those things are incredibly important too. Um, I was just thinking, I forgot to ask you one of the most important questions. You and I have worked together in, for a long time in this space and CTAP, which is the organization I've been part of, big fan of CAPSI. Um, and this whole notion of, you know, sort of having these conversations and, and how do we have these conversations at the time that we need to, I, I forgot to ask you the most basic question for people who don't know, can you explain to people who aren't familiar with what the heck is palliative care? Like, what <laughs> is palliative care? Because most people don't know what that is. Yeah, that's and it's a not really, an important thing. That's a really good point. And I must have forgotten my media training because I should have started with that right away. <laughs> So palliative care is actually a relatively... A good interviewer would have asked you that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. So we got there eventually. Um, a pretty new medical and nursing specialty. It's um, less than... It's 2007, so 13 years old. Um, that is focused on relief of suffering and quality of life for people living with a serious illness. So for example, ranging from if someone's in pain or can't catch their breath or is very constipated, those things cause tremendous suffering and they can be treated. Um, unfortunately, many clinicians never got the training that they need to do that. So we had to create a field that had expertise in the relief of physical and psychological suffering. That's a huge piece of it is. And by the way, if you ask people what they are most afraid of near the end of life, it's unbearable suffering. Yeah. They are more afraid of unbearable suffering than they are of death. Yeah. And, um, you know, sadly, they've seen that in their friends and families. They've seen inadequately treated pain and other symptoms. And people are, so they, there's some under, it's understandable that people are afraid of that. And this field rose up in response to that very real gap in our system. The other piece of it is skilled communication. It is not like we're born knowing how to, ask people to tell us more about why they feel a certain way. It requires training. It's a procedure. Um, just as we would not send a medical student in to do an appendectomy um, after they'd read a chapter on it, having conversations with people about what matters most to them and helping them explore those things is a procedure and it requires training, practice, mentoring, and coaching. And what we do in this field is bring both the symptom skills and the communication skills to all of our colleagues. And the analogy is when I was a medical student and an intern and a resident, I learned how to manage heart failure or emphysema from cardiologists and pulmonologists. But I do that myself in my practice now. I learned it from the specialists. So similarly, symptom management and communication gets learned from the palliative care specialists. And then our hope is that those skills spread to all clinicians taking care of all of their patients. And in a way, much as your answer to one of the questions earlier was about a return to love, a return to community, a return to dignity. Um, really what palliative care is doing is returning us to who we were when we all lived in, you know, in one small space and knew everything about each other and cared for each other from, you know, birth till death. 
um, with no secrets and survival always in it together. And right. again, maybe that's the place where the light is getting in here is it is creating for everybody an awareness, whether they know how to name it or not, of the tenants of palliative care. Absolutely. And, and one of the things I've noticed on, on the social media planet is that palliative care teams are in as much demand as ventilators. Um, palliative care teams are a scarce resource, just like ventilators. And there is a tremendous growth in recognition of the urgency of treating human suffering and communicating effectively with patients and families. Um, and again, I hope that that recognition of the essential nature of palliative care will uh, outlast this pandemic. Well, so in your final words, what, what encouragement can we give both paid and unpaid caregivers? How, what words of love can you share with them? Because they're tired. This is a lot. This is stuff that folks are working around the clock um, on this front line. Yeah. It is bringing out the best in us, the best in humanity, the uh, level of care and commitment to the care of perfect strangers that you see in our hospitals every day at enormous personal risk, personal risk and risk to families. It is, it's, it's like soldiers going off to war. It's people at their best, at our best, put others first. And that's what we're seeing. And it is really gratifying to see it. I'm very proud to be human right now. Yeah. And thank you to caregivers everywhere. We love you.